for me, Tony, the modern presidency uh, represents a change whereby the president, uh, rather uh, than Congress or political parties or state leaders, uh, becomes uh, the, the center of, of, of American uh, democracy. And part of that was a change where both Democrats and Republicans, uh, in, in a sense, uh, forfeit their important uh, responsibilities to sustain the parties. Hi, this is Tony Williams, Senior Fellow at BRI, and we are pleased to bring you another episode of Scholar Talks. For this episode, we are honored to have scholar Sidney Milkus, who is going to discuss his book, What Happened to the Vital Center, Presidentialism, Populist Revolt, and the Fracturing of America, which he co-authored with Nicholas Jacobs, and this is part of our American Presidency series. So the guiding question for this series is, what are the constitutional powers and limits of the American presidency? And by way of introduction, Dr. Sidney Milkus is the White Burkett Miller Professor in the Department of Politics at the University of Virginia and a faculty fellow at the Miller Center. He has written or edited 14 books, including The President and the Parties, The Transformation of the American Party System Since the New Deal, also Presidential Greatness, and a book in its ninth edition, The American Presidency Origins and Development, 1776 to 2021. And uh, a book I love, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, The Progressive Party and the Transformation of American Democracy. And of course, he's won numerous awards for his scholarship and teaching and lectures frequently all over the country and really all over the world. So Sid, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Thanks for having me, Tony. Great to be with you. Uh, really, you know, I really love this book because, you know, I've, I've thought a lot about and we do a lot of work at BRI on how to promote civil conversations. Why do Americans seem so divided? And, and you give a, a very important and, and very interesting answer to that kind of centered on uh, the presidency. So, so let's dig a little deeper. Mm -hmm. And my first question is the vital center of American politics seems to have fractured along these deep ideological divides, this political polarization. As I like to say, we're even fighting about where we buy our burritos or our coffee and, and that kind of thing. <laughs> I mean, we're just so divided. Uh, but, and, and, but how has the presidency, populism, and especially, as you know, the decline of parties really contributed to our current situation, our current predicament? Yeah, well, um, an important um, uh, buttress of the vital center uh, was the party system. And in fact, the party system is a critical intermediary, intermediary organization that has uh, played a critical role in building a consensus in American politics. Tony, going back to the beginning of the 19th century, it's formed during the Jeffersonian and Jacksonian periods as a highly decentralized, highly mobilized kind of patronage based system. Um, and it kind of, uh, it lasts so long, it's so powerful uh, because it fits, it dovetails with powerful um, principles of American politics decentralization, love, uh, localism, love of community, um, uh, limited government, um, and also uh, a, a commitment to kind of a, 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 kind of a, um, a property and, and comfortable materialism. Uh, and, and so it, 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 it rooted itself deeply in Americans' hearts until the, it began to fall apart in the 20th century because it began to be viewed with the uh, changes in the world and American politics as an institution that was too provincial, too unprincipled uh, to uh, govern American politics in the wake of the massive changes that began to occur in the 20th century, the Industrial Revolution, uh, the United States being pulled into world affairs, massive immigration, rise of civil rights activism, which seemed to call for a more purposeful national uh, government. Uh, and those, those calls for a more purposeful government uh, led to the uh, defense of a stronger presidency, which was really, uh, uh, Tony, uh, as you and your listeners probably know, quite weak uh, until, until the 20th century. Now there were exceptions to that. Episodically, we'd have heroic leadership like Jefferson, Jackson, and Lincoln because of crises. But what it begins to happen in the 20th century is the presidency become, power becomes 
more routine uh, rather than episodic. This begins with Woodrow Wilson and Theodore Roosevelt uh, during the Progressive Era. I'm honored to hear you. Uh, you, you love my book on Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, but it's consolidated. And the modern presence is institutionalized uh, as the center of the New Deal political order during uh, the, the 1930s. And what that tends to do is to shift uh, partisan responsibility to executive responsibility. And whereas in the traditional party system, members of Congress and state and local uh, public officials were, were really the key figures, that power begins to shift gradually to the presidency. Uh, and, and so uh, Roosevelt describes this as a, as a shift from kind of uh, uh, provincial uh, politics, inefficient politics, uh, to what he called optimistically <laughs> enlightened, administ enlightened uh, administration. And uh, this, of course, uh, strains the constitutional foundations of American politics considerably, executive aggrandizement challenges all those, those features of American politics so deeply rooted, uh, I mentioned before, uh, particularly a commitment to a decentralized republic uh, and, and limited uh, government. Uh, and and the, the growing power of, of the presidency makes American politics a more um, uh, 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 either a winner take all kind of politics. It's not an institution uh, like the Congress or the states, uh, state legislatures, or the party system which pulled these things together to, to hammer out consensus, to build com compromises, to pull together uh, some kind of un common understandings in a, in, in a large diverse uh, country. Uh, and, and so that begins, as that uh, de develops and the presidency grows stronger coming out of the 1930s, uh, that begins to put a, a serious strain uh, on, on, the, on, uh, on the country. The country uh, is gradually fractured and the national resolve uh, is, is some, somewhat weakened. Now, what really uh, makes the, this, this change uh, uh, radioactive uh, is uh, the changes uh, that occur in the, in the 1960s. Um, uh, for a while, there was a kind of a rough consensus, to, uh, a, a kind of bipartisan commitment to the New Deal uh, and uh, because it, 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 it was embodied by a national security state and welfare state, which seemed to provide a sense of needed security in the wake of all those changes that had occurred in the uh, 20th uh, century and the, the Great Depression and World War II seemed to make the New Deal uh, uh, such an, an indispensable kind of, 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 of political uh, order. Uh, but that began uh, to fall apart. Uh, in, in, the, in the 1960s, and this is where we get to populism. Uh, populism has always been important in American politics. Ep, you know, episodically, again, uh, there's this eruptions against the constraining forces uh, of the Constitution, claiming the system is, is rigged, uh, that it, that it uh, ignores the disadvantaged in American politics, that allows elites uh, and establishment to feather their own nests at the expense of the people. But what happens in the 60s is that there's this kind of uh, ex ex uh, explosion of issues uh, that for a long time had been not if, um, marginalized or at least constrained in American politics. Matters of uh, race and, uh, uh, and, and gender, uh, broadly conceived uh, matters of identity, uh, which uh, uh, kind of agitates uh, the culture war, which is so familiar to, to us now. And whereas the New Deal emphasized battles over security and domestic and international affairs, which lends itself somewhat to compromise and bargain. Uh, the issues that emerge in, in, in the 60s, uh, civil rights, women's rights, the anti-war movement, uh, those issues seem to defy uh, the kind of um, pragmatic political system uh, uh, that the American, that, that had traditionally characterized American politics. So the growth of the presidency uh, and this movement politics combined in the 60s, we see this with Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon, both who, who see their ambitions being served by tapping in uh, to this, these cultural conflicts that are emerging. 
in a way that's very combustible and, and fractures the nation uh, and, and really uh, leads to a major departure from the New Deal state. And I would say now uh, what, what conservatives and liberals are doing is battling for the services of the administrative state for joining the New Deal to serve either liberal or conservative purposes. Right. Yeah, uh, very important. And, and uh, the two-party system seemed to mitigate two of the problems that we face in, in our society, namely uh, the, the threat of populism and, and demagoguery uh, and, and how they uh, perhaps threaten our, our democratic constitutional order. So, so how did the party, party system for so long mitigate that? It mitigated it because it was uh, uh, it was highly decentralized, mm -hmm. uh, and and so it wasn't possible for Donald Trump to capture somebody like Donald Trump, a charismatic leader, uh, to capture uh, uh, the party, uh, and uh, and also it had uh, important institutional power to constrain the presidency. So, with the, the development of the two party system during the Jackson Jacksonian era era, you get these, uh, the national convention, which is kind of the institutional foundation of the two party system. And every four years, uh, the Democratic and Republican parties, that's the way it looks after, after the Civil War. Uh, but both the Democratic and Republican parties would kind of um, reassert themselves in these quadrennial uh, elections. Uh, and uh, the conventions were made up of party leaders, uh, members of Congress, state and local leaders, who had the power to nominate a president uh, and, to, and to establish a, a, a platform. And a lot of times those conventions were messy, compromises were formed. The convention system, uh, like many uh, institutions in American politics, was uh, destroyed by the antinomian um, politics, the anti-institutional politics of the 1960s. So um, throughout the 20th century, there had kind of a, been a kind of a populist insurgency attacking parties uh, the leading institutional uh, remedy of, uh, or weapon of that populism was the direct primary, which would take power away from the party uh, leaders and give it to voters in primary elections. Uh, and, uh, but but uh, those reforms moved rather slowly until the 60s. And, there, and there's a really powerful destination with what are called the McGovern Fraser reforms, which, uh, which grow out of the civil rights uh, an anti-war movement, an attack on this kind of important institution of the establishment, these decentralized provincial corrupt uh, party organizations that are obstacles to achieving racial justice, uh, justice abroad in the, in, in, in the United States. And so the national conventions are replaced by this system we have now of primaries and open caucuses, a kind of plebiscitary, media-driven system. And it really reaches its culmination Tony with uh, Barack Obama and Donald Trump, who for all their uh, really uh, remarkable differences share two traits. Uh, they both uh, disdain party organization and they both see themselves as leaders of movements. You mentioned it a, a little bit in the, in the first question, but what role do the progressives and, and Franklin Roosevelt play in the development of what you call in the book, a president-centered partisanship? The idea um, um, behind the modern presidency. I mean, first, first of all, we have to say, well, what is the modern presidency? Whenever I teach it, my students say, well, what is this thing, the modern presidency? How is the presidency from, let's say, Franklin Roosevelt on different uh, from the presidency before? Um, and the difference is uh, the, the, the political system and the presidency before the New Deal um, uh, was anchored by a, uh, decentralized parties with a, that, that really had a, 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 a collective identity with a past and a future. Couldn't be dominated uh, by, by a president. What the, for me, Tony, the modern presidency uh, represents a change whereby the president, uh, rather uh, than Congress or political parties or state leaders, uh, becomes uh, the, the center of, of, of American uh, democracy. And part of that was a change where both Democrats and Republicans, uh, in, in a sense, uh, forfeit their important uh, responsibilities to sustain the parties, um, no, uh, nominating candidates for office, raising funds, 
developing a program, uh, mobilizing a base, all of that which was done by this highly mobilized, decentralized party system, party system is kind of transferred to the presidency. Uh, and, and that begins an important way uh, during the presidencies of uh, Wilson, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, and, and, Frank, and Franklin Roosevelt. And Franklin Roosevelt really brings it to a, to a head in his second term, uh, where he begins to uh, come into conflict with the decentralized Democratic Party, particularly this very fragile alliance between Southern Democrats and Northern Democrats. Southern Democrats are very opposed to some of the overtures, more ambitious programs of the New Deal. And when Southern Democrats are at the center and voting two critical parts of New Deal institutional reform down, uh, that being the court packing plan uh, and the Executive Reorganization Act, which would create the, an institution of the presidency, making it an institution rather than an office, Roosevelt seeks vengeance on Southern Democrats and engages in what was really then a revolutionary action, pioneering the purge campaign in the 1938 midterm elections, where he enters the primaries, particularly with notable Southerners and border state senators who oppose the New Deal, uh, and tries them to replace them with 100% uh, New Dealers. But it shifts the gravity in the party uh, from this kind of decentralized establishment to the presidency. And thereafter, the presidency begins to give a form to parties. And that's accelerated uh, by the McGovern-Fraser reforms, which enables presidential candidates and presidents to form a direct connection with the party base, with the party constituency. Right. And, and something very interesting that happens in, in the 60s and 70s, which you alluded to, are, are the transformation in, of liberalism and the conservative movement. And so how do they contribute to this growing polarization and sort of shared mistrust of institutions? What, what happens uh, coming out of the kind of um, um, uh, rebellions uh, of the 60s, the emergence of all of these uh, the, these movements is what we now consider the democratic and Republican basis, the most loyal party uh, supporters who uh, are uh, uh, unyielding defenders of its most ambitious uh, programs and commitments. The critical nature of the transformation is liberalism, which was dedicated to a kind of moderate view of the welfare state, one that compromised with Jim Crow in, in the South uh, and, and uh, national security shifts from, uh, from that kind of commitment to domestic and international security to what we now refer to as identi identity politics. Uh, the notion, I think Jesse Jackson uh, talked about liberals and new liberals ambition being a rainbow coalition, uh, a, a, a commitment to, satis to fulfill the rights of those who are under privilege in society and also to, um, uh, to reject the kind of imperialism uh, that uh, the activists that emerged in the 70s associated uh, with our foreign policy with, after, after, after Vietnam. America was no longer a city on the hill as it was. Uh, and, and conservatism, which was committed to limited government, you think of uh, Mr. Republican Senator Robert Taft from Ohio, who was committed to limited government in domestic and international affairs. And that, that represented his opposition to the New Deal. Um, that kind of conservatism shifts into a much more uh, aggressive form of socialism uh, um, aroused, uh, and, and Barry Goldwater is the kind of, uh, blares the trumpet to summon uh, this new, new conservatism, uh, which uh, believes, still believes in, in traditional values and America playing, uh, fighting, uh, uh, evil like communism uh, uh, abroad, uh, but feels that uh, liberalism has so corrupted the country that just restraining government is no longer adequate, that now conservatives must can commit themselves to modern, to modern executive power uh, as a weapon to defend uh, traditional values, uh, to restore America's, uh, the idea of America as a city on the hill with a, with a critical role to play in foreign affairs. And then uh, with the, uh, after, after September 11, 2001, to protect the homeland, 
which, which really becomes a kind of core commitment of the Republican Party after the Bush administration. So one of the things that happens with uh, conservatives uh, as a result of the New Deal is they no longer are committed to limited government and they begin to view the presidency uh, as a double-edged sword that can cut ideologically in a conservative as well as a liberal direct, uh, direction. Nixon begins this in defense of the silent majority, but Ronald Reagan really uh, establishes a, a, as a critical part of conservative politics in the United States. So we now have a liberal conservatism that, that uh, view themselves, so, uh, view each other uh, as kind of an existential threat uh, to the country. Uh, they have an undeal, unyielding view uh, of, 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 of what uh, it means to be an American. Uh, each of them has a, a view, but those views are, are really uh, in serious conflict, so much so that a lot of my colleagues suggest that we're now in a period of the Cold Civil War. Well, on that note, uh, that leads me to my final question. And maybe final question, we're just getting warmed up here again. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> And maybe it's a sobering one, but well, hopefully you can leave us with a hint of optimism. You know, what can be done to mm. limit or or hopefully perhaps even reverse the effects of this executive centered partisanship uh, that that seems to just divide us so much and sort of plague our embattled political system, civil society, social media, uh, mm. all of it. it. Can you suggest a few things that might be done? One, I think, is to um, enhance participation in the United States. Now, this may seem to be in conflict with the idea of populism that, we, that has become so rampant in American politics, but, but what has happened in this kind of movement politics tied to the presidency uh, is it presumes to be participatory democracy, but really you have strong feeling minority factions dominating each party. And even though we've had some increase in our turnout, 60%, I think, in the last, last election, 40% still don't vote. Uh, and, and so I think the effort now in some of the states in the name of populism, restricting voting, um, um, uh, the access to voting uh, is the wrong way to go. Um, and, and I would just um, uh, go with Walt Whitman, the poet who described America's uh, elections as America's great choosing day uh, and make uh, our elections a national holiday. And I also think we should encourage voting in person it's better when people see each other out at the polls. Uh, there's a, I, I, maybe it's just because I'm a political scientist, but I feel like I'm doing something important <laughs> when, I, when I go to the polls. But I think we need to get more people out to vote to, to begin to take some power away from these bases. Uh, a second thing is we have to figure out a way, Tony, and I haven't figured it out, a way to revitalize party organizations. We can't restore the state, state and local uh, parties. Uh, their day has passed. That would lead to a kind of national Tammany Hall. Um, you taught, you mentioned Tammany Hall right before we came on. Uh, you know, a kind of national spoils. And we can't, no longer can afford that, but we have to figure out how to establish national organizations that have some independence uh, from the presidency. And uh, we go into some detail of this in the book. And I would, but I would just say that what we, we uh, Nick and I really urge is to strengthen the national conventions and, and change them so they no longer simply a, a, a confirm the verdict of the primaries uh, and, and coronate the presidential candidate. We have to figure out a way uh, to engage uh, members of Congress, uh, important figures at the state, state and local uh, level before the primary contest in a kind of convocation where they, be, they begin to lay out the principles of the parties that might shape the primary contest. So I know that sounds pretty utopian, uh, but it's the, it, the general objective is what I would, I would stress. And then finally, I think we have to figure out a way uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, uh, to roll back presidentialism in our politics and, and government uh, and, and re-engage the presidency uh, with, um, with the Congress. Uh, because one of the things that's happened in this executive center partisanship is Congress has kind of delegated responsibility to the president uh, to, carry, uh, to carry out its objectives. So when there's a Democratic president, uh, Democrats in Congress uh, sacrifice institutional integrity or loyalties for partisan loyalties, and the same thing happens with the Republican. We saw this with, in the 2020 convention, the Republicans said, 
our platform is we, we pledge our loyalty to the president's America first. <laughs> so we have to figure out a way to tone back uh, the, the uh, 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 presidentialism in, in the United States uh, and re-engage the president and the Congress. And one of the things I've stressed, and nobody seems too excited about this idea, but I, I, I don't think we can become a parliamentary system. Um, but I think it would be a, a good idea to adopt one, um, uh, one um, ingredient of a parliamentary system, and that is has the president go before Congress at least once every two weeks and engage in a question period. Instead of the president just simply um, uh, in, um, carrying out uh, responsibilities that have been delegated to him uh, by the Congress or, or, or only engage in Congress in the State of the Union message, uh, it, it would lead to some serious arguments. Uh, people may get a, a little frustrated, but I think it, it, it potentially could, could be healthy. And I also think we need to cut back on the institution of the presidency, which is in, in the, this White House office, the West Wing, and this massive executive office of the president, uh, and, and restore some of those responsibilities to the cabinet uh, and the Congress. Uh, um, I think presidents ought to be defending the regulatory program, not before OMB and the Office of Management and Budget, but before important committees in the Congress and departments and agencies and the executive branch. So those are Milkus's tepid <laughs> responses to an existential crisis of democracy, Tony. <laughs> fair enough. Uh, fair enough, Sid. I, I think that uh, we would all watch C-SPAN a little bit more if those debates are on there. Wouldn't we? Yeah. Wouldn't we? we might even get some coverage on by the regular networks, right? That's right. I, I know I would watch. So uh, the book is What Happened to the Vital Center, uh, and basically uh, an important book on uh, helping to restore American democracy and civil conversation. Sid, thank you so much for joining us. Really my pleasure. Thanks. It's been an honor to be with you. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us on this episode of Scholar Talks. Uh, please check out our other interviews in the series with our illustrious political scientists and historians on the American presidency. And also watch our extensive library of interviews on the topic, including the series, The Cold War and the Presidency. Uh, also, Steve Knott on the Constitutional and Populist Presidency. And Sarah Burns did a great interview on the presidency and war powers. Also, please check out our highly popular BRI curriculum, The Presidents and the Constitution. Thank you.